welcome to episode 54 of the Sports Geek Podcast. On this week's podcast, I catch up with Dave Jolene from Dazologic, now Ski Data, about sports website development and what he's learned over the years working with several teams. And of course, we preview C 2014 in Miami. Welcome to the Sports Geek Podcast, the podcast built for the sports digital marketer. And now, here's your host, who's changed the Sports Geek Twitter handle three times, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. That's right, I have changed the Sports Geek Twitter handle three times. Originally, it was underscore Sports Geek underscore, and I hated the underscore, so I changed it to Sports Geek HQ. And then, lucky enough, through a few friends at Twitter, I was able to nab the Sports Geek handle. And just a real a tip, if you are changing your Twitter handle, always secure the old handle and redirect fans. There's nothing worse than changing over your handle and have someone go and squat on that old handle, as people may have recognized that handle. So, uh, pro tip for players, it is a bit of a, a switch tactic you've got to be very quick about creating the new account switching it over grabbing the old account Um, but you really want to do protect your brand you don't want someone tweeting on an old account Uh, bags are packed presentation and notes for all the panels that i'm working on for seat are nearly done Um, i catch up with al crombie on abc grandstand and preview some of that stuff that i'm looking forward to at seat and then also catch up with fellow seat steering committee member dave sholene and talk a little bit about uh, the geek side of sports and sports website development. Uh, so it's good to catch up with Dave later in the show. But first, here's Al Crombie on ABC Grandstand. Uh, LeBron's not going to Miami. Sean Callanan's going to Miami. That's yeah, the big news. Yeah, exactly. I'm using the ABC Grandstand <laughs> to announce that I'm going to Miami. Um, but no, I'm going to Miami for a, for a conference. On, and so if anyone wants any cut price LeBron gear, I'm sure I'll be able to get a stack of it. Uh, so I'm heading to the, uh, Miami next week. Uh, for the SEAT conference. I've spoken about it before. SEAT, S-E-A-T. Yeah, so it's a Sports Entertainment Alliance in Technology. So, mm. you know, really uh, right in the wheelhouse, as they would say, uh, for what we do at Sports Geek. Um, and so it's where uh, there's three tracks of uh, sports business professionals sort of turn up. So it started as a CIO, so the Chief Information Officer of all the, of all the pro teams, so the guys that manage all the tech. Uh, the geeks of the of the sports world, so uh, they're the guys that set up Wi-Fi in stadiums and make sure uh, databases are, are, are running and making sure that fans are getting the right offers, those kind of things. So keeping all the technology that's you know really growing space in in the sports field, especially in this in the stadium um, sort of area. Um, and then the other two two tracks is a CRM, so the customer relation. Ship management system. So again, being able to understand your fans, tr- uh, track what they're doing, present them with the right offers, um, integrate campaigns with sponsors, those kind of things. We've spoken a few of those guys uh, with Francis on the show. Mm-hmm. And then the track that I'm, uh, I curate, I curate the uh, digital track. So it's the digital guys who are producing the content, uh, running the social media platforms and engaging the fans on the platforms that, that they play on through their mobile devices and in the stadium as well. So, it's always, uh, last year it was in Kansas City and, uh, I hobbled around on, on, on crutches. Um, so I'm looking forward wow. to be able to walk it's around. It's been a year uh, already. It has been, <laughs> has been a year. So, uh, really looking forward to catching up with, uh, some of the teams that are there, um, both from a, a, stri- uh, US point of view. So a lot of the pro teams will be in attendance, but then there's also, um, you know, a good contingent of international. So, um, myself coming from Australia and then bigger names like, uh, Richard Clark, who we've had on the show from Arsenal. He's going to, be, he's coming down to Miami because, uh, Arsenal will be having a trip to the, to the States. And I, I really think a lot of the EPL teams will be, uh, pushing their marketing into the US after the World Cup and mm. seeing that the US are really interested in, in football. Um, so yeah, really looking forward to it. And there'll be some big discussions on, I guess, the future of digital and well, how to so, connect with the fans. I mean, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because it's it's really, you'd be riding the kind of the first wave almost in just seeing the growth in how, especially with fan interaction and all the digital components in stadiums and you have mentioned on the show before, mm. but um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a really exciting new aspect of the sporting experience. Yeah, and so like one of the panels I'm I'm running is is on the uh, the, the the fan trifecta of uh, you know technology, um, and engagement, and and digital, and how they sort of weave that together. Um, and so some of the guys on the panel, and we I'm really looking forward to it. You know, to have someone from 
Um, we've spoken about Major League Baseball, Advanced Media, their technology company, uh, ESPN, uh, the NFL, um, New England Patriots, to talk to them about how they go about engaging the fan. And the fan can be in different places. And so you've got to, you've got to, uh, work out different profiles of these fans. You've got the, you've got the fan on the couch, uh, that has their, you know, their mobile device while they're engaged with the, uh, the TV and they're watching the game. So how do you communicate and engage them and, and not, you know, not distract someone from what they're watching, but provide, you know, extra benefits for that, for that experience. Then the, then the, then there's the fan that, the, that is on the move. And this is the fan that is being targeted more and more because we are, we're on the move all the time. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, whether we're, you know, on commuting, walking, you know, at work, uh, anything like that. So, and fans still want that, that information. Mm-hmm. So, how you go about connecting with that fan or even the fan that's coming to the stadium? How do you engage with that? And then the whole other experience is how do you engage with the fan that's at the stadium? So that is, you know, making sure that there is Wi-Fi, but then making sure that you've got these utilities, whether in, it's in your stadium itself or in the, in the apps that you develop. So, so some of the things that we'll be discussing are things like, uh, uh beacon technology. Uh, so beacon technology is this t- technology that's available, uh, in, uh, in iPhones and, and Androids uh, is, is, is where you, you can set up these beacons is what, what they call, and they send out either a, uh, a sound or a, a Bluetooth message and it'll send a push notification to your phone. So it knows that you're in the stadium. So guys like the Golden State Warriors, as you walk into the stadium, says, welcome. You know, welcome to the stadium. Oh, by the way, if you go to Bay One Two Four, you can pick up uh, your special bracelet or, mm. or a giveaway or something like that. So it's a little way to thank the fan for coming to the game. A little personal touch. Yeah, yep. but then there's also what they can do is present offers to people in specific parts of the stadium. So if you're going to uh, the upper levels or the nosebleed section, and and they can have a beacon at the top of the escalators that say, "Oh, just remind you that oh, there are some seats in the lower level if you want to upgrade your seat." So it's not put pushed out to everybody in the stadium, but just the people that it's completely relevant to. And so just that, uh, you know, that small uh, notification can turn people to go, oh, yeah, I have got a bit of extra uh, cash in my pocket. I wouldn't mind sitting, you know, close to the court. I never get an ch- opportunity. So it's that kind of technology that one, you know, makes you want to open mm-hmm. up the team app, but then also, you know, get a better seat, bring in more revenue increase, you know, uh, engage, uh, increase the fan experience and make them want to, you know, come again. So they're, they're the, some of the, some of the topics that will be, that will be discussed. Um, yeah, really looking forward to it. Yeah. Fantastic for you to, to be amongst that, especially with some of these big players that uh, on the list of paper here, some, some big, big sporting clubs involved. I mean, I know you deal with, um, AFL clubs here, NRL clubs, yep. uh, Where's Australia at in regards to this fan interaction and getting on board and, and just the, the tech aspect of, of, of the sport? Well, I think from a from an outside the stadium point of view and the, and the content being developed and, and pushed out, I think the team's doing you know a terrific job and are in that same sort of space. Um, they're probably just a little light on for the amount of resources, but from a content point of view, they're pushing out a lot of content. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but we can, it's hard to compare. Uh, the AFL NRL clubs with, with say, what, uh, Richard Clark at Arsenal has is at his, at his Arsenal, if I can use that term. <laughs> uh, cause he's got a bigger, he's got a bigger team and, mm. and that kind of thing. So it is a matter of a volume thing. Um, but as far as the content they're producing in, you know, serving their fans and competing against media outlets, they're doing a good job. The, the next stage is that in stadium engagement and that is, you know, real, needs the technology to be rolled out. So we've spoken about before that uh, stadiums like the SCG is getting that rolled out, uh, ANZ Stadium is getting that rolled out. Um, so there's a few that are getting that, that technology. And once that te- technology is rolled out and fans realise that they can use their phones, then the next step is to have the mobile applications that get installed to have that functionality. So mm-hmm. again, like the Golden State Warriors, it's great to have the beacons in there, but then it's the, the key thing is to have the beacon technology integrated with your app so you can... Uh, you can send to someone a ping when they walk into the uh, the merchandise store and it just presents you with an extra offer. So you you were just browsing, but now mm. you've been told there's an extra ten percent if you because you've opened your phone and it's told you about it. So it's more more you're more likely to buy because you've just been given that offer. Mm. So that's where the that's where the you know when you can do those kind of offers and people can say, oh, we can roll this out and people will spend more money in our shop or people will will buy upgrades. Like again, if I was able to go to the MCG. And there were level two seats available. Why wouldn't I want to upgrade to a comfier seat or, or whatever? Mm. But we don't have, you know, that, that type of tech isn't 
isn't quite there, but it's not that far away. So, you know, there's got there's uh, players in that space, and you know, I'll be catching up with the stack of them at seat that are, are rolling out that technology, and as the ones that provide extra revenue and you know increase the fan experience, but mm. it's the revenue one that will probably the one that'll be ticking the box first because it's an easier way to justify it. The whole return on investment is what uh, teams are looking for. So that Wi-Fi, you know, who pays for the Wi-Fi has been an, a, you know, an equa- a, a push-pull equation that teams, venues have been have been struggling with. But there's more and more ways to to monetize that, and that's where that's what's going to lead teams to to start using it and really to get stadiums to roll it out so teams can use it. And that's the that's the battle in Australia to a certain degree. Yeah, looking forward to um, to hearing what you come back with from yep. the uh, from the big conference. Um, let's move on a little. Just get some other little tidbits before we uh, head to the news. Um, technology doesn't always enhance sport. Sometimes it can hinder sport, as we've seen in the Tour de France. Yeah, you were just talking about the the tour and the and the crashes I was hearing overnight. Um, I hope hopefully no one uh, from the public was involved because there's a there's a bit of a problem on the tour. Uh, we've t- spoken about it before, and you know when you're at a sporting event, there's a big big pull for the people with the phones to 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 prove that they were there and uh, you know brag about it. And it's something that as sports marketers you love. You want people to brag that you're at an event. You want people to take a photo and say oh, I'm here. But it's causing a bit of a problem in the in the Tour de France is is because uh, TDF selfies seem to be trending. So people are waiting uh, to see the the riders go past, and instead of you know cheering them on and saying they're doing a great job, they're turning around, putting their back to the riders, and taking a selfie with the riders driving by. And uh, there's no rear vision mirror on uh, on a <laughs> smartphone as yet. So that there's and in some instances. Uh, members of the public are stepping onto the track and causing some, uh, yeah, it's causing a little bit of concern for the riders because they're trying to they're trying to ride in a uh, professional bike race and uh, some idiot is walking out, turning their photo and go, "Hey, look at me! I'm at a bike race!" Or running uh, alongside them, running you know, alongside. getting video footage. And, and the thing is, there's you know, people have tweeted, "I nearly died" with a big <laughs> smile on their face. So it, it is a bit of a concern. Um, you know, I'm sure the guys at the TDF love the fact that uh, their fans are you know fully in and and committed and those kind of things, but it is a bit of a security concern. So I think it's something that they've, they've got to keep an eye on. But, uh, yeah, a bit, a, bit of dan- you know, a bit of danger. You wouldn't do it at running the, with the bulls, I would have thought. Mate, great to have you in. Have a wonderful time in Miami, and uh, we look forward to chatting to you. Uh, when you get back, I'm sure you'll come armed with a, a whole new set of knowledge. We can rock on with it for another year. Until no, the next one. No worries, mate. Good on you, Sean Cullen, our resident Sports Geek HQ. Just go to the website, sportsgeekhq.com. Sign up for Sports Geek News at sportsgeekhq.com slash sign up now. So, yeah, don't forget I'll be live tweeting um, from Seat and uh, sharing a lot of content from Seat. And I will be launching a specific ebook around the digital campaigns from around the world presentation. So we're not only the slide deck, but some supporting information around those campaigns. As I said, I'm still currently working on it. I will get it completed before I do it. Um, that will be released on uh, to everyone who's on the Sports Geek News email list. So simply go to sportsgeekhq.com slash SGN and you can sign up for that and you'll get an email to download that ebook. Uh, really looking forward to it and thank you to everybody who's helped uh, contribute it and share some info of the different campaigns that they've done. Uh, remember to follow Seat Conference on Twitter, the Seat 2014 hashtag and uh, follow Find Seat on uh, Facebook. We'll be sharing a whole bunch of stuff on all of those platforms. I'll be I'll have a page up that is a little bit of a hub to keep track of everything. If you just simply go to sportsgeekhq.com slash seat2014, uh, we'll do our best to curate uh, some of the best content there. And you can also catch all the podcasts that I've done with people who will be attending Seat if you want to be in catch-up mode and you're looking for something to listen to while you're travelling to Miami for those who are heading down there. Um, looking forward to it. One of those, uh, one of those people who will be down there uh, is Dave Sholene. Um, I now know how to pronounce his name. Uh, from Days of Logic, a good mate of mine that I caught up with initially at Boston. Had a chat to him about the techie side, get into the geeky side of what I used to do in being a coder and, and a developer. Uh, Dave is still very much in that space and, and we talk about some of the trends that he's seeing in the space and also in what he's doing uh, with products like TicketNet 
and his uh, fan loyalty platform that he's rolling out with the multiple teams. So here's my chat with Dave Jolene from Days of Logic and now Ski Data. Very happy to welcome a good mate of mine all the way from Portland, Oregon. Uh, Dave Jolene, I always have trouble with your name, Dave, with that uh, silent S, silent J. What I don't know what's going on there, but Dave... Jolene from Diesel Logic, but now uh, moving into uh, working with Ski Data. Welcome to the podcast, Dave. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. How do I say your name again? Because I keep stuffing it up. My family says Shirlene. It's a Swedish name. Everybody has trouble with it. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I get my name misspelt uh, regularly, Sean. I often get my coffees in the morning and someone calls out, Scene, Scene. So, <laughs> I, so I'm, uh, I'm right with you there on getting your name... Uh, mispronounced um wanted to have a chat with you um i think we first met at seat was it in boston uh, yeah. uh in 2012 um, yeah that's right uh sort of talk to you because you know i come from a you know i've told my sports geek story and i was a i was a coder before i started uh, sports geek but you're still very much uh fingers locked to the keyboard uh you're still coding away done a lot of work uh in in the sports world uh, website area. Do you want to give us a little bit of background of your, you know, your your backstory in the world of sports? Sure. Yeah. So I'm really rooted in the technology and the, the development side of things. Um, you know, it seems today I don't get to code as much as I'd like to. I got a, a small team that does a lot of it now, but I still get to do a lot of the architecture and uh, the deep dives into some of the geeky stuff that uh, that I really love doing. So I'm a sports geek as well. Um, so actually, right as I left school in 2000, I started working for the Trailblazers, and mostly working in their CRM. Um, kind of graduated from there to work with their scouting people. We were actually doing a lot of statistical scouting, you know, back when the you know the Moneyball book first came out. Everybody was really big on that. Yep. Uh, and then did a lot of stuff moving over to their uh, you know the marketing team and promotions. So I uh, really have a lot of experience within all different facets of. Working in sports. So going back there, I think uh, your old name came out through a common friend, uh, Dan Harvison at the Trailblazers, and the and the I'm a Trailblazer fan project that was sort of one of the sort of the first you know fan only sort of community based websites that were developed sort of, and it was done sort of pre pre Facebook era. Yeah, we, we came out with that in 2000. Uh, we were working on it in 2008, and we launched in 2009. Hard to believe that that was even that long ago, but that was right as uh, Facebook was kind of getting into wide release. Yeah. Um, so, so what would what did you, what did you guys learn from that experience, and how has the I guess the landscape changed? You know, what did sort of social do to that sort of uh, those sort of sites? Well, we were a, a very early mover in that space, especially in the private social network. The big thing that we learned with that probably is, uh, you know, kind of keep it simple. We bit off a lot on that. That, that is a huge platform, the I Am A Trailblazers fan. Um, you know, so nowadays you don't have to really build all that. So much of the social network pieces, pieces are built for you. And you can repurpose those in mashups. You can just use Facebook as a social network or Twitter and then just kind of build off of that, the different features. Yeah, I, I do remember, like I met Dan in uh, 2010 when he came to speak in Sydney, New Zealand. I was at the same, same conference I was at and it, w- it definitely was that first mover advantage because it was there was a few teams that had built those those kind of sites before Facebook. Um, but then if you built them after that, after that, you know, after everyone had sort of started migrating to Facebook, it was very hard to, to drive that community. And now, as you sort of said, it's... It's not that you have to build that whole community. It's how do you integrate that community into the community that's out there, um, you know, using things like Facebook Connect and and um, those kind of things because, you know, people don't want another another network to a certain degree now. Right. You want to interact with the fans where the fans are at. And so a lot of teams are doing a better job these days of, you know, having a, a really well-moderated Instagram feed. And, of course, Twitter is, you know, ingrained everywhere now. Um, but it's a matter of striking a balance between having that uh, conversation on the social network and also bringing the user back onto some of your properties so they're immersed in your brand, uh, interacting with your, you know, your representatives, and, uh, and you can control the narrative better that way. So some of the things from a, from a techie point of view that you've worked on, we've sort of discussed the Trailblazer thing, but you're now, your, your role as, as director of engineering at, uh, at, at Ski Data, you're moving into the 
into the ski data uh, family around uh, the loyalty stuff. Um, do you want to sort of touch on some of the stuff that you've done sort of so far with, with some, of the, uh, some of the NFL teams around, around the loyalty space? Sure. So the uh, some of the earlier work we did with uh, the I'm a Trailblazers fan is evolved into what we have right now around our rewards platform. So we're probably on a third generation now, and we've simplified it a lot. So we don't, uh, you know, we don't do so much. We do we do less, but we do it a lot better than we did before. Uh, and so with that platform now, we're in with a lot of uh, a lot of the NFL teams. We've had uh, quite a bit of traction with uh, the Broncos, the Dolphins, the 49ers, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, so it's really taken off. The um, 49ers are probably our, our latest uh, property. We just launched that in wide release probably a week ago. And, uh, and they are really pushing the envelope on what can be done and, uh, and, how, it, and how it works across all of their platforms. So one of the big pieces with the, uh, that the 49ers were interested in was, uh, was integration, which has always been a problem in sports. We have a lot of vendors that are making good products, but they tend to be siloed. So how do we get that? Uh, you know, how do we get that data to flow into our CRM, into our data warehouses, so we can turn that into you know actionable intelligence? And so they looked at a lot of vendors uh, and a lot of different teams that were running these systems, and after a long search, decided that they wanted something that was really open. So without going too techy and doing too much of a deep dive, uh, they really liked kind of our service-oriented platform that lets them extend our membership services and our reward services across their different. Um, you know, Facebook platforms, mostly mobile. Uh, they're doing some really interesting stuff with um, allowing users to, to transfer their points into, uh, uh, into money so they can actually buy concessions in the arena. And that's a first uh, for, the, uh, for the industry. Yeah, so, so it is when, you know, again, going down to the techie stuff, but it's just really you having a platform that has an API or, you know, application programming interface to be able to plug in the different components uh, that that the 49ers or any team might be wanting to do. And I think, you know, one of the things, and I, I spoke to, um, you know, I've spoken to a few people about the sort of the loyalty game and, you know, and you look at the, the, the industries that have done it exceptionally well in that, you know, airline industries and, uh, and retail, you know, sports now is moving into that same same space you know people who are buying the ticket people are buying the merchandise um, people who are, are engaging with the with the with the team are the ones are the ones getting rewarded and it's very easy to turn around that that ROI to say well this person is spending all this money that they're the people we should be rewarding so that's sort of why a lot of these teams are sort of you know pushing their chips uh, in with uh, with loyalty programs Right. And a lot of the teams that are doing it well are really focusing on the motivational aspects of it that come from game theory. You know, that's the biggest probably change that we've seen in the last four or five years in that space. Uh, and we've seen that a lot with, you know, a lot of the Facebook games, the farm bill and, and things like that, that just find really easy ways to uh, hook into a user's, you know, kind of motivation, whether it's intrinsically or extrinsically motivating them, whether or not it's uh, something that they're doing, uh, interacting with their friends or if they're competing with other people or just finding some way to give them like a, a really quick reward to kind of get them accustomed to, to doing things, to earning more rewards and to train them that they can get some pretty cool experiential rewards if they stick around and come back to the site a lot. So those are the, those are the sites that are really being successful and we're seeing uh, more and more teams kind of privy to that and getting that and knowing what to ask for. So this is really around sort of engaging those, the, you know, your key fans, your, your season ticket holders, which is, you know, most likely the most financially invested uh, in your team and, and really deepening that relationship with them. Um, had a really good chat with uh, Shane Harmon about membership marketing, which I think Australia does really well. I think this rewards sort of uh, data that you're starting to get will, will help you understand the financial side of things. But if you can put those rewards in and you know give the fans things that they really do want whether it's a, a a pass to walk on the field before the game or or a special exclusive access to to a locker room or a, or a chat with the coaches it really deepens that emotional investment with the with the team and so it disconnects the oh, I'm paying this much dollars to go to the game it's like I'm not even thinking about the dollars because I'm so emotionally invested with the team that it doesn't become a financial uh, question at all it's always an emotional investment so it's a bit of a, you know, 
I guess you would have seen the uh, the Facebook study that came out with them uh, supposedly manipulating the news feed uh, to see how it affects people and the, and the uproar around that. I mean, to a certain degree, it's just Facebook testing it to make their product better, but it did make them sound very much evil. Um, but they're pretty much just trying to make their make their product better and and I guess deepen that emotional engagement with their with their fans. So I didn't have a massive uh, issue with it, um, but it is what is that your sort of take on it as well? Right, we want to find um, the you know, the most efficient way to interact with fans, the way you know the the way the fans want to be interacted with, uh, and the you know all these teams have limited resources, and uh, you want to make sure that anything that you're doing is getting the biggest bang for your buck, and so. Uh, we try to be smart about that and look at research around things like the, the game mechanics to figure out what it takes to get to that point. So going back to the what you said there, bang for your buck, um, I did talk to um, Jeff Eldersfeld from, from the Blue Jackets who uses uh, TicketNet, which is, a, which is a product that, uh, that you built, which is a, uh, you know, a ticket sales lead product. Um, and, you know, you want to tell us a little bit of, about that and how they're going about using it to, you know, sell more tickets and get more sales leads. So it's more it's more transactional, um, but it's sort of a it's a it's a way for the fans, you know, it's a way for them to at least engage their fans and have that exchange of we want your data, but we also want to run these cool promotions for you. Right, and TicketNet when it's run in kind of the classical sense, it's a you know you're aware it's a really flexible promotion, but uh, when when it's run in just kind of the simple way. The point really is to um, is to improve the perceived value of something of something you're offering. So it's it works on referrals. Uh, it, it's not built really around a system that you can refer your friends to join if you want. But uh, you know it's all about referrals. Like we're incentivizing the referral, and then we're getting some pretty good uh, pretty good prizes around that too. And the idea for that really came around you know what Gmail did when they first came out. They had this you know kind of new exclusive email platform, but you couldn't register for it unless you were invited. Yep. And so that, you know, this, it, uh, you know it's, it builds exclusivity and, and improves the value of it. So we try to, we try to take um, offers that we can, uh, you know, all the teams have certain ticket deals, you know, for a Tuesday game or a, you know, a package and that kind of thing. We try to get some kind of a special offer that we can uh, make available only to ticket net uh, registrants. And allow people to refer that. So you can only access that if you're uh, if you're an insider somehow, or if you get referred by an insider. Yeah, I mean, and so the, when it, the the case study that or the use case that I've been uh, playing around with at the minute, and I'm not a fan of Subway, so I don't know why I keep using this. Um, but effectively, you can you can put out an offer that says, you know, get a get a 12 inch Subway for the price of a six inch, uh, you know, through through our through our team. And by the way, if you do that, you can get, uh, you know, you can you could win a signed jersey or something like that. So you're you're automatically you know pushing a sponsor into your into you know giving a great offer to your fans, and it doesn't have to be a ticketing offer. In this case, it can be a half price uh, subway, um, but they can exclusively get it, and that's sort of the the part that then becomes sales leads down the track. Absolutely, and that's and that's kind of the beauty of the ticket net promotion is that these are people that are in your in your market. Uh, they want to go, you know, they're fans. They want to go to your game. Um, and depending on what you're using as an incentive, you know, what you're dangling for the carrot, you can ask quite a bit of information. So if you're giving something that's kind of small away, maybe it's uh, they have to buy a ticket, they get a, maybe a discount or something on it. Um, you, can, you can ask for some information. If you're giving away a free ticket, maybe to a preseason game, that's poorly attended anyway, you can generally ask for more information. Yep. Um, and then, of course, a lot of teams... You know, they don't like the idea of discounting tickets or especially giving tickets away. So it's always good to bring a sponsor in there and have the, you know, any kind of a discount be a courtesy of a sponsor so it doesn't seem like you're, you know, have distressed inventory. Well, yeah, and that is really important. You know, if you're just pushing out a, a, a ticket offer and, and you're training, you don't want to be training your fans to know that those offers are always out there. Um, you know, so that's that's super important and you know plenty of people listening who who sell tickets understand you know the term papering the stadium you don't want to you don't want to be known right. for for doing that um also get going off uh, some of the stuff that you're doing where do you you know over the past you know 5 years which is it's it is eons in a technology world um you know how is the how is the advent of the traffic moving to the mobile change what you guys are doing from a from a cutting code point of view, 
Well, um, basically, for us, it means a variety of things. I mean, we need to we need to have responsive websites that work. Uh, just work on the phones. I mean, we're seeing uh, we're, we've crossed the threshold to fifty percent traffic on mobile. So anything that we design needs to be designed mobile first. Um, we've been doing that for a while here. Um, and then so we're seeing that. And then also just because we have you know, APIs, we're able to integrate those into any native development as well. So uh, a lot of times, a lot of experiences don't work very well on, uh, on web mobile. Yep. Uh, just because of the connectivity. You know, Facebook tried to do a lot of that kind of stuff, and they, they, they scrapped it and decided they were going to go native. Uh, and so we generally recommend any kind of a you know, submersive, complicated interaction you want to do with a, a fan on the mobile handset, you might want to go native on that. So if you do that, we do expose the API and allows you to, to pull all of our membership and user information into a native application. But that's pretty much where things are going. I mean, it's, we've been going native for a while, and uh, I think it'll continue to go that way. And we're going to see more mashups on, uh, on mobile. You know, the, uh, some of the big mobile players that we're talking to right now are looking to inter- interact with us, to integrate with us, as well as some of the other best of breed uh, systems out there, like the uh, ticket upgrades and stored value and things like that. So when you say say native, you're saying app uh, apps within mobile integrating with each other with, with each other's apps. Is that would that be the right way of saying it? Right. So you're going to see um, you know anything that you're going to download from like the App Store or the Google Play Store. So stuff you're actually going to install on your phone. Um, the uh, some of the big mobile development uh, the mo- big mobile players out there are going to be offering these integrations to the teams. So the teams won't have to necessarily try to get everything from one player, they'll be able to uh, pick and choose and get the best of breed in a single interactive, uh, single integrated mobile application. So a couple of things, I guess, to get your opinion and sort of takeaways being, you know, a, a sports geek in the space and, and more geek uh, than, than I am. I've sort of uh, not hitting the code as much as you, you were. If you're in a, if you've got those IT skills and I think they're highly in demand uh, in the sports space because they're, they're growing all the time, um, you know, and you see that at, at seat. Um, where do you, if, if you've got that type of skills, how, how can you break into the sports industry or, or where should they be looking to, um, to work? Well, if you want to, you probably want to get ahead of the curve a little bit. So right now, big data is the big buzzword and cloud. And uh, you know, the systems like re- like the uh, loyalty reward system allows you to collect a lot of information. So um, with information, you know, information needs to be digested, be consumable to turn into knowledge. Right? We're seeing a lot more uh, teams who are uh, interacting with. Uh, they're engaging with data warehousing companies, a variety of data warehousing companies. So probably the analytical side of things, you know, the ability to do ad hoc report generation, uh, work with some of these NoSQL databases, uh, and just the ability to uh, you know, sift through large amounts of data and kind of the principles behind that are going to be paramount to anybody trying to get into the system in the next few years. And I, th- I think what you said before about um, when you s- sort of started the, the scouting analytics and, and you know, Billy Beans and Moneyball, I, I really think, and definitely seeing it grow at, at seat with the CRM side of things, the new money ball is being up. Is that big data? Is that how can you analyze that data? How can you make sense of it? Because all the teams are getting the data, but the data doesn't isn't of any use if you don't if you don't use it and understand it and and analyze it. So again, if you can get into that, if you can get into that space. Um, because there's the people who, who analyze the data, but then there's also the extracting of that data. If you can't get, you know, give me a list of uh, single game purchases that uh, within this, you know, the 100 mile region of the of the of the of the arena uh, from your database, then you can't go back and put that offer out. So, um, yeah, having some SQL skills um, and be able to query query your uh, CRM to get that data is uh, going to be paramount and making the right offers. Absolutely. Yeah, and a lot of teams, I think, <clears throat> are uh, they're starting to get that and ask the right question. So anything that, anything that we want to get out later, we need to uh, ask for now. So if any teams are undergoing any kind of rewards implementation or any kind of, uh, of course, CRM, or you know, there's some teams that are just now adopting CRM. But anything that's going to be uh, doing a lot of lead generation, you want to know from the beginning what kind of questions you plan on asking. So you can begin with that in mind. Otherwise, you might find that you get to that point and you don't quite have everything you need. And it's hard to go back. So 
uh, we're seeing a lot. We're seeing people ask for a lot of information, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out in the next couple of years with uh, with how it gets used. There's a lot. There's several uh, several uh, companies that are out there right now that are just looking to integrate, uh, you know, kind of the back office systems, all the CRM, even ticketing, uh, access control with the front, you know, the user facing systems, the uh, you know, ticket masters on that side, the ticketing people on that side, and of course the loyalty reward systems, and bring those together to have kind of a unified dashboard that shows, you know, in one place and sometimes in real time, um, how you know how things are going, how sales are trending, uh, even what people are talking about, you know, the sentiment analysis from the the social network feeds and that kind of stuff. And so it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out in the next few years. Yeah, and especially how the I guess the evolving legislation. And commentary around privacy as well, um, you know. So I think people will become uh, a bit more restrictive of what they share. Um, legislators will will pull people up as well. So you know, the days of asking for everything or uh, you know having a Facebook Connect that uh, that enables you to get everything, I think, are probably closing very very soon. So you've got to be very tactical about what you ask and and I guess why you ask it as well. Absolutely. You need to give them a good reason to share that information. And usually you need to give them something in, in value return. So. so just a few questions to finish up the interview um, because pretty much everyone I have a chat with uh, are sports fans uh, in essence because that's part of the reason they're in the world of sport. Um, so what would be the best stadium you've attended as a sports fan? Um, let's see... Been to quite a few. Um, I think the uh, you know the new Levi Stadium is really neat. It's not open yet. We took a tour of it in uh, in January. Um, there's probably going to be some some press coming out about that pretty soon. So I'll let them launch that one. Um, it's got to be at a game. You've got to go to a game. It can't be just. Uh, you, I don't, it doesn't count. I've done tours of stadiums when they're empty, and it doesn't count. Uh, yeah, no, no, but they're, they're doing some neat things. So you'll see. Yep. They're, they're yep. kind of they're, they're they're turning some of these concepts on their head. It's going to yeah. be really cool. Yeah, I'm I, excited. I have, I have seen the specs and some of and some of the stuff that's coming out. And yeah, I I can't wait to go to the stadium myself. But yes, so a, a stadium sporting memory that you've been to. Uh, well, I got to say Fenway Park, and that's going to be low tech. But it was uh, it was you know just the history there. It's so. Uh, it's such a neat place to go. It was, yeah. And, it was uh, pretty cool to uh, to go there in uh, for a seat when it was in Boston. Um, so your best uh, sports biz tip uh, for people either in the industry or trying to get in the industry? Oh, best tip. Well, it's, you know, a lot about uh, sharpening the saw and uh, keeping up on the latest. There's uh, this kind of funny talking guy out of Australia. There's a podcast I'd like to listen to. I recommend that. Um you know, from a technology standpoint, um, I don't just for me, I'm on the technology side of things. So uh, just kind of keeping up on things. If you can really keep up on the cutting edge of technology, you're always going to be in demand. Uh, you know, things are going um, social, open source today. You know, that kind of stuff, the standard things. Yeah, um, I mean, technology. I mean, it's a it's its own beast. Um, as someone you know who did it for 15 years, you've got to. It's I, I liken working in IT is into surfing because you've got to find the next wave. Um, yeah. You know, so I, you know, I did three or four years with with Power Builder. Then I jumped over to to .dot net, which you're, you know, you're still working with with .dot net. And then I sort of looked at the social space and Apple development and stuff like that. You know, uh, you've got to see where where the market's moving and have that skill set to be able to one move your skill set to to meet it um, and meet it at the time when, when that wave is at its zenith, you know, so whether it's, Hey, Y2K bug is out. I better start fixing those type of systems. Um, it's very much in that space from an IT point of view. So it's all about, all about seeing those trends. Right. And it's always moving faster and faster. So you have to be prepared to be, you know, you know, what you learn today is going to be obsolete probably in two years and you have to really like to learn. You have to be really inquisitive and you have to really patient. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, and that's sort of the whole, you know, agile methodology um, that I think more people in sports are starting to see because it's sort of being forced upon them uh, from the from the tech side of things of being being able to move quickly and and take those changes and deliver you know deliver things deliver things quickly because that's sort of where the whole startup scene is at the minute. Mm, absolutely, yeah. So working a lot with uh, you know from a technology standpoint, we work a lot with the end users. 
um, you know, throughout the whole cycle of a project. And that's just the only way to do it. You know, so we, we don't get off the rails, you know, you don't uh, finish a project and deliver it and have somebody say that's not what they asked for. So people know exactly what the project is. We always have working software. We could launch at any time. Um, so, I mean, that's those uh, agile methodologies have just improved the software craft immeasurably. Well, thank you very much, Dave, for joining me uh, on the podcast. I look forward to catching up with you um, in Miami at uh, Seats 2014. Um, until then, I'll uh, speak to you soon. Thanks a lot, Sean. Check out which teams work with SportsGeek at sportsgeekhq.com slash clients. Thanks again to Dave Jolene for that chat. Looking forward to continuing those kind of techy geeky discussions in a few of the sessions at SEAT. Um, as I said again, follow the SEAT 2014 hashtag. Uh, and if you cannot make it, if you're not going to be there at SEAT this year, uh, please mark your diaries now for SEAT 2015. Um, as you would have heard if you'd listened to the episode with Christine Stoffel, um, a bit over 400 people attended Kansas City, and this year there will be over 750 people in Miami. So, again, kudos to Christine and the team for uh, building this conference up. Uh, That clock is telling me to shut up and get out of the podcast. This has been episode 54, sportsgeekhq.com slash 54, where you can get the show notes and links to everything that Dave discussed earlier in the podcast. Uh, that's pretty much it for this episode. Please check out the new iTunes uh, logo or the new iTunes cover art uh, for the Sports Geek Podcast. And if you could leave a review, that'd be much appreciative. This week's Sounds of the Game comes from the man himself, LeBron James, at the World Cup final. It's quite apt, just a week after we discussed uh, the issues around Vine and Instagram video that one of the biggest athletes in the world tweets out a video of a streaker at the World Cup. See you in Miami, guys. Please leave a review on iTunes. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash iTunes. Find all Sports Geek podcasts at sportsgeekhq.com slash SGP. Need help with your content? Book in for a content brainstorming session with Sports Geek now. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash work. See you in Miami. Thanks for listening to the Sports Geek Podcast.